We are pilgrims on a journey and companions on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and share the load. My name is Lorraine and I was born in Sydney. I was born in Carlton, which is in the St George district. And I actually was born in a private hospital. Now my mother had four girls and one of which was born in about 1917. Um, my next sister was 19 and then 20, 1921. I came along 16 years later. So the year that I was born was during the wartime. And um, that, that was a very interesting period. People born around those areas, we've just come out of the World Depression. I was born in 47 to Agnes and John Wright. Um, we lived at Alexandria. And um, he uh, got transferred to Newcastle. And so they didn't have a home to live in. Um, so dad built this shack at Mount Hutton uh, in the bush, dirt floor, open fire. Uh, our mattresses were put on the floor for beds. I had three stepbrothers because uh, mum was married before she married my father. We used to have this creek and we'd call it Crouchy Creek. And it was yabbies that used to live in the creek. And my older brothers would go and collect these yabbies. And we, they'd make a little fire and they'd cook them. And they taught me how to eat yabbies and fish for yabbies. Being the youngest of six kids, um, it, was, it was really um, difficult because there was such a spread of ages. Um, and by the time I was growing up, there's, you know, like there's about 15 years difference between the oldest. Um, and so the hierarchical situation at home sort of situation was, um, was also difficult because they went through a lot, of, lot more trauma than I did with regards to you know, how people dealt with, you know, what was, what was classified then as half Aboriginal or half breeds and all this sort of stuff. My history goes back to my mother. She came here from England in 1911. My grandfather had come the year before in 1910. I've only just found that out a couple of years ago when I checked up on my uh, background, my history. Um, he, we came from, my mother came from a family of Hammonds in England. Now the Hammonds are very professional, well-to-do people in England. Uh, they were builders. I think my grandparents built the West Ham Town Hall. But my, my grandfather was a drinker and they were very religious people. And his family actually sent him away from England and sent him to Canada. But of course, when the ship comes out, years ago, it used to go all the way around the bottom of Africa it was going to Canada and he got off at Sydney and he liked Sydney. So he stayed here, then nominated the family out. Then I started school at Warners Bay a Public School when I was five. But when I was six, mum and dad saved enough money to buy a house at Hillsborough. We had a toilet outside, we had a bathroom, it was fabulous. Anyway, I started school there at uh, South Cardiff Public School. And I lived there until I was eight. Uh, we were the only Aboriginal family. Uh, there was only one Australian family there. The rest were Dutch, Yugoslavian, um, Croatian, 
and it had the flat there where we lived at Hillsborough, it hadn't been developed, but there was all lovely homes there. Actually, the, um, the childhood was rather interesting, and I think it was different for most people because um, you know, my father being Aboriginal and my mother being white, her, her parents came from Scotland and uh, they emigrated here. Um, it was a very, the home life was different to most people that I, that I, that I went to school with because um, a classic example would be, you know, the storytelling and, and, and how, we would, how we would relate to things because my father was very proud of his culture. Um, but he did have a lot of difficulties with um, reconciling his culture with what uh, what you know main society wanted at that particular time because you got to remember this was the 60s and um, but growing up itself um, you know as I said we've had um, we had pets in the in the backyard but they weren't really pets we had you know kangaroo we had a snake we had rabbits and all this thing and because we're a very poor family. Um, you know, they weren't pets as such, they were necessities as we got hungry for things, so they became you know, our food sort of source that way. I always remember my childhood. That, that was a very interesting period and when we're growing up I think we grow up with the attitudes of our parents. Uh, we had coupons during the wartime. We'd have coupons for butter, sugar, petrol, clothing. We even had all those sort of things that, um, but it, it did teach you the value of money in so many, in so many ways. I went to school at Carlton South, uh, that's still there, of course, uh, and then I went to Cogra High School. And it was great living with all these different people. It was fabulous. I remember the juniors, uh, they were Dutch and I went there, they had two girl, twin girls, they were the same age as me. And I used to go to their place to play a lot. And they were the first to make plastic raincoats uh, in their garage. So we all, all the kids that lived around Hillsborough there got free ra uh, raincoats to, um, so people could see that they were making raincoats. And it was fabulous. And then uh, one day, um, these people come to the house and um, I heard my father yelling at them to get off his property. I can't do this, I can't do that. Anyway, um, he said to his father, there's nothing to worry about. Then a few weeks after that, um, they come, Dad was doing night shift then. At, at, he finished at Lysart, he was working at the BHP. And, um, Someone kicked the front door in, knocked my grandfather down, uh, woke me up. My youngest brother was in bed with me, he, Terry, he was just a bit over one. And my two other brothers were in the other bed. Um, Steve was six and David was four. And um, they took my two brothers out of the house and put them in a car. And then they come back and they grabbed my youngest brother out of my arms and my grandfather couldn't get up. Um, anyway, he said to me, run in it, and I did. And I got to our chook pen, and this man caught me and took me and put me in a different car with a lady. And uh, we, we were driving along. I said to them, where are you taking us to? And they said, oh, we're taking you to your auntie's place over at uh, Glendale. But I said, you're going the wrong way. They said, oh, we're just going a different way. Well, I was taken to Willamata Girls' Home at East Maitland. Uh, I didn't, at that time, I didn't know where my brothers were taken. And it was an orphanage. And all the girls there, I was the only Aboriginal girl, but all the girls there, they were from um, babies to 16. And they were all different nationalities. And we all had the same stories. Our parents had separated and they were taken and put in homes. Then it took Dad six months to find out where I was and this lady said to me on the way to Willamata, she said, oh, your father got killed at work, that's why we come and took you out of the house. And then it was about six or seven months, Dad turned up at the home. He 
they let me see him for an hour and I said, where's Poppy? And he said, Poppy died. Apparently my grandfather went to bed and died a fortnight later. So I stayed in that girl's home until I was 10. Um, I didn't find out until my auntie and uncle uh, applied to take me out of the home. They lived at Warhope. They had six children themselves. And they come down and got me and took me to Warhope to live with their family. And they were telling me where my brothers were, that my uh, three brothers were taken to Glen Eden Boys' Home up at uh, Glen Innes. Uh, my youngest brother, my cousin, took him out of the boys' home after a couple of years. And then my two middle brothers, they had to stay in the home until they were teenagers. They were um, now, it was United Churches homes. Uh, my two middle brothers, Stephen and David, they were brought back to Woodlands at Wall's End at Newcastle where Dad could go and see them frequently. Now I stayed at Warhope with my auntie and uncle and the kids until I left school. Looking back at, at my education, were we ever taught anything about Aboriginal children? Uh, it was only in my later years that um, I would be realised through my own experiences that we had Aboriginal people here. We only were looking at the people that were migrating from overseas. In the early 1900s, we had all the um, Greeks and the Italians come here. That was because we had a lot of builders, but nobody to build houses for. They were the immigrants that came that we spoke about, but not about the indigenous people that were here. Um. I copped, I copped it at, 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 um, at school a bit, um, where people you know, didn't quite understand. But by the same token that those that did understand didn't care. You know, I had one of my best mates, Colin Cohen, when I was in primary school, went from infant school to the end of primary school. Um, he was um, a mainstream uh, Australian and um, it was never raised, it was never an issue. We were best mates, we hung around with each other. You know, his family were brilliant. Um, so you had those sorts of things. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a complex issue of, for some people, I wasn't white enough. For other people, they didn't care, you know? And, and, it, was, and it was just like, there was no big issue about it. But I think that was a transition period that we were going through at that particular point, because we were still singing um, Rolf Harris's Tie Me Kangaroo Down Sport where you know, it says let my abos go loose blue in, in a, you know, which we're all singing but now we know hang on that's actually a derogatory thing that's going on you know so hindsight thing. so it was the, the acceptance that um, that I was experienced from some people and others but on the side, other side of the coin because I was half white sometimes I would have issues with um, you know, people from the other side, from the uh, from the indigenous side, um, where I wasn't black enough, sort of thing. So there was a there was that sort of conflict that was continually going on. Um, when I was sixteen, I came back to Newcastle to um, live with my dad's older sister at Glendale. Uh, I stayed with my auntie until I was 17 and um, her husband had passed away. All her kids had grown up and were left home. So she said, it's hard to get a job up here. How about if I rent my house and we'll rent a flat in Sydney? So this is what she did. She brought me to Sydney. Living in Warhope, we didn't associate with any Aboriginal people. Uh, my, there was only two Aboriginal families up there. Um, and we were allowed to go to the pool, go to the movies. Like people used to say, oh, you don't go to Foster, don't go to Kempsey, because if you, well, we did go to Kempsey one day and we went to the movies. And um, we had to go right down the front and sit. Aboriginal people had to sit right down the front and our heads was like this. I had a sore neck for a week. But in Warhope, we could go anywhere. 
we were treated just like anyone else that lived in Warhope. I didn't realise how bad racism was because it was just something we heard about living in the country. Not being black enough and not being white enough. That was very complex. It was simple for me at, at, when I was a kid because I didn't care. Um, you know, I didn't fully understand the, the, the concept of half-breeds. I didn't understand you know, why some people liked me, some people didn't, you know, uh, on both sides of the fence. Um, it's only when you have this adult mentality in hindsight that you think, actually, that was pretty crap. <laughs> You know, um, and it was a it was a it was a tough way to do because being this colour with an Aboriginal father, being taught Aboriginal traditional ways, but living in a Western society, um, there was I I wasn't aware of the struggles that were going on. I could never understand, and I am very much into why do we have a label? Why I am an individual? And that then encouraged me to look at people as an individual and not with a, an actual sign on them or of, of who they are. Now I've always had an attitude that was really taught by my parents to help one another. My mother was a great um, charity worker. I can remember that in the um, early or the late 1930s, she would go with it. She was with a 2UE club. It's Radio 2UE, but they had a club. And they used to go to Hurstville RSL and they used to knit um, socks for the soldiers um, and do all these things. And she raised money for Cogra Hospital. And I felt that I really got the charity of doing for others from my mum and dad. They would always be helping. Now, my husband often used to say to me, I don't know why you do the things you do. And then all of a sudden I found out I was born on International Peace Day. And I said to my husband, well, look, I think the good Lord made me that way. Well, that's why I was born on that date. The first time that I met an Aboriginal person was about 25 years ago, but I was unaware that this person was of an Aboriginal background. This young man uh, was a friend of my son's and he's like, uh, he didn't have a mum or dad and he was like my surrogate son. I met Peter, um, Lorraine's son, at, um, at church at Padstow Baptist. We, came, we became friends, became good friends, and, and um, he invited me over his place once, you know, to, uh, I can't remember why or what, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything special, it was just calling over and saying good day or something like that. And um, that's when I met uh, Lorraine and Jim. Lorraine and Jim uh, instantly accepted me. Um, we had conversations about, um, about his childhood. Um, Lorraine talks about her childhood an awful lot, um, and things that that, that she went through and all this sort of stuff. So it also, that, that, those, those early meetings and, and, and talks and discussions promoted a, a, a closeness because there's a kindred spirit. Yeah, you've had crap happen in your life and I've had crap in my life, but look how good we are now, you know? And um, so, yeah, so I started getting invited to barbecues and birthdays and things like that. And I, and I constantly now, um, Mother's Day, have to go there. Christmas Day, there. The family photos, you know, from, from the very first year I started going there and saying g'day, um, I'm in the family photos now. So, you know, so Lorraine became, you know, a surrogate mother. Um, she introduces me as um, her um, surrogate son, you know, to people. Then I think that um, it was only then, uh, about 11 years ago, 
that I saw this lady sitting at a Harmony Day function for Hurstville Council. Um, and I went up to her and just said, hello, my name is Lorraine. But I had a, I had a group of ladies from all faiths, uh, which is all spiritual, and I needed someone from her background. So 11 years ago, Annette was the first person that I got to know. So when I met Annette, I was amazed, or I think I had my eyes open, as to the intelligence of these people, the strength of these people. Uh, I, I feel that the culture that, that she's from, they all help one another. Uh, for instance, I live in a house here and I don't always see all my neighbours, but all, they are all so close together and they're looking after one another's uh, welfare in, in looking after them because they're all part of just one big family. But there can be many families within that group. And one thing that I really did not understand or have a lot of knowledge of was how talented these people are. Now, Annette is so talented with her art and how they can tell stories with their art. That, that fascinates me. I went into Eora College and enrolled myself. I wanted to paint like Albert Namajira, do landscapes. Then I, um, I wanted to do uh, screen printing and do fine arts, so I had to do my school certificate to get into university. So I did that, I'd done four years at Eora College and then two years at Wollongong Uni to get a fine arts degree. Uh, when I finished there, I, um, I was teaching art over at uh, Seaforth TAFE until that closed down and we were all sent to um, Meadowbank. And I stayed there for a few years and then I retired for good. This is, this is rather interesting because traditionally um, stories uh, are told orally and also within you know, the confines of sand pits and things like that. There's no batteries or anything like that. We've all got a finger or we've all got a stick so we can actually communicate. Now the symbol for a person or community um, or you know, wife or children or things like that is that and if you look at that if you're at the beach, sit down, plant your butt down, get up, look up, look down at it. This is the, what it comes from. When you're walking along the beach and you look back at your footsteps, what do you see? You see the footsteps, you know, just disappearing in the distance. So you've got these dots. Um, you had a sitting at a fire, so which, which is your home and you're sitting around the fire, so you've got the fire there. So you've got a, a person or a community sitting around their, their campfire at their home going through. So this little story, well, it's just a very quick one, is this person sitting, sitting at their fire decides to send a message stick to um, some some friends that they might live across the water. If you look at water when it's traveling down, you know, and the message stick arrives at these people's places. Another one comes here. So the message stick is going to all these different communities. And the message stick suggests that we all meet at a big community campsite. where we're going to provide shelter. We're going to provide food. And we're going to have people coming from all around, having a talk and doing things. Now, this is just a simple diagram of someone sending out a message stick 
to some people, inviting them to have um, food and conversation. Uh, this picture is about my father's um, people. Um, it's called Swampy Creek. Now, this circle in the middle is where my father lived. Now, all the other circles are, are all family homes on Swampy Creek. And um, from what the, my father and my auntie told me, it was just relatives that lived there. And um, the three lines joining the circles are the tracks of where they walk to one another's homes. And um, in here is, there was water and there was land. And I just find it, the colours change over the years. I think the year that I, this last time I was up there, it was a good year because I saw these colours. But um, it means a lot to me um, because it took me a while. Dad never ever spoke about his land. It, um, Dad passed first and his oldest sister was still alive and she started to tell me different things about how they come to live there, it was given to them, the land was taken off them and when my father was a teenager and um, and she told me all about it and you know the, the eight circles around there they were all relatives that lived on, on, on Swampy Creek. This is actually an interesting um, painting. Um, it was given to me, it was actually painted down at Nowra uh, in the 1940s, early 50s from what they, they told me. The reason this, I, I actually like this, this, this painting is, um, is because Indigenous artwork is all about creation and um, fertility and food and gathering, all the life skills that, that, that promote life. Um, and, um, and this is fairly indicated here with, um, with the, uh, the goanna, with the, um, the, the egg there going in there and other eggs going there. But more importantly also, you know, the dilly bag to pick up the eggs and collect the eggs, uh, as was explained to me um, here. Here down here is the traditional symbols um, for man, woman, child community. Um, so you've got a community hunting the eggs of, uh, of the goanna. What is particularly significant of this, and this was pointed out to me, was we have a scorpion here um, and a no, um, don't touch, as in poisonous um, uh, symbology, uh, which results in, in, in death. This doesn't happen. Um, this is how it's been explained to me. It was just um, this, because it was the 1930s, 40s, we now see the, um, the European influence and symbolism that coming in there, recognising that, you know, illness and, and things like that um, are a fact of life because within our culture, death is not really um, one of those things that are discussed. This rug, when I met Annette for the first time, I was very, very impressed by her personality, by her strength. And I thought, I'm going to do something of a kindness that will show her my sincerity as to her background. And I created this rug. I have, within the stitches, made mistakes because we have made mistakes.